Okay, welcome everybody to another installment of the workshop on entrepreneurial finance and innovation seminar series. Um, we're excited to have a paper on um, Silicon Valley and venture capital. Today will be presented by Yulia Jeskova from the University of Chicago. She's got lots of co-authors, so I'm going to let her introduce them. A quick reminder on the format. So uh, the paper's got 40 minutes for the presentation. Um, uh, Yuli is going to pause every once in a while or let our co-authors in, um, interrupt with questions. So we encourage you all to use the chat to ask questions. Josh and Rick are at least here. There might be some more co-authors. Um, and after that, uh, Juanita will be presenting a uh, discussion for 15 minutes, and then we'll have an open Q&A where we'll either unmute people um, or we'll have a response to the discussion. So with that, check the chat for the paper. And the floor is yours, Yulia. Thank you so much, Mike, and thank you for all the organizers to for inviting me to present our paper. Uh, thanks for Juanita to agreeing to discuss that. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, our paper called Fencing Off Silicon Valley, Cross-Border Venture Capital and Technology Spillovers. This is co-authored with uh, Ufuk Aksijit, uh, Sina Ares, Josh Lerner, uh, Rick Townsend. Uh, and me. Um, so, and before we start, I need to um, I need to say that the views expressed here are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect those of the Board of Governors or the Federal Reserve System. So, one of the most contentious topic uh, in the U.S. politics uh, is the treatment of foreign investors. Uh, it's still pretty much on the agenda, uh, despite changes in the uh, in the politicians uh, and in the parties. Uh, and this is all happening sort of like uh, in the framework of the increased uh, foreign venture investments in the U.S. and specifically um, a bigger presence of Chinese investors uh, uh, on the venture capital market market. Um, and in particular, the areas where these foreign investors uh, mostly like to, to invest and their main interest is captured by artificial intelligence, robotics, fintech, uh, all this sort of like uh, evolving frontier uh, technologies that US is so good at. Um, as a result, the cross-border corporate venture capital investments as part of this sort of like relationship between foreign investors and uh, and US companies is of a particular interest. We see a big increase in the presence of both corporates in the venture capital market and the presence of foreign investors in the corporate uh, venture capital market. Um, and partly this is because this type of relationship between uh, corporation investing in the startup is pretty well suited to gain critical insights from the technologies that these foreign investors are investing in. So that sort of uh, bigger growing interests uh, in US startups from abroad led to enactment of Foreign Investment Risk Modernization Act in 2018. And in particular, it led to tighter oversight of foreign investments in US startups uh, as a way of like protecting the ideas and the technology produced domestically. This is not just sort of like the questions and the dilemma that the US uh, stands in front of. Uh, similar similar controversies happen in Australia, Canada, Israel, UK, Germany, and many other countries. And yet we don't see, uh, especially in the from the economic perspective, uh, lots of studies on the foreign competition for inputs, um, especially such inputs as uh, R&D. And this is basically where our paper steps in. Uh, the focus of this project is uh, to analyze the role of the cross-border capital flows um, in overseas technology, transferring technology spillovers. And we're gonna sort of like approach this question both theoretically and empirically. On the theoretical side, uh, we're gonna have an endogenous growth step-by-step -step innovation model. Um, and in particular, we're gonna focus on modeling uh, explicitly cross-border investments and relationship between venture capital investors uh, from abroad uh, and uh, US domestic companies that they invest into. So the idea here would be that foreign investors can provide finance to domestic innovations that otherwise, that otherwise um, would have been lost. But the trade-off here is that through this exposure to US technologies, these foreign investors gain some spillovers and this like spillovers may lead to security threat for US from the foreign nation. We take this model to the data, we calibrate it, uh, and uh, our goal here is not to um, 
you know, particularly target the exactly uh, numbers of the U.S. economy, but more like to test the predictions on the uh, CBC investments, on the domestic innovation and the knowledge spillovers uh, that we can get from this framework. Uh, and in particular, of course, we're going to be interested in the optimal policy response. Um, what are the optimal barriers that need to be set for the foreign investments to sort of like balance these two forces uh, in the that, that I mentioned before. Uh, and then we're going to turn more into the data, into the empirical analysis. Uh, we're constructing a novel comprehensive data uh, on non-US corporate investors uh, who are interested in US startups. Uh, we are able to quantitatively estimate the benefits from corporate venture capital investments, both for the foreign countries and for the US startups. And overall, this sort of like empirical part is also going to provide some evidence in, in support of our model. And before I, uh, I jump into the more detailed discussion of the model, let me just preview the results. So overall, we find lots of evidence supporting cross-border technology spillovers. Um, on the one hand, we indeed document uh, significant benefits from this relationship between corporates abroad and US startups. For the foreign investors, they do indeed learn from this uh, from this interaction, uh, we do see that the annual probability of a citation to a US startups double after investment and this like increase in the citations sort of like signals about the uh, stronger knowledge spillovers going in the direction of the foreign investors. But domestic startups uh, benefit from that too because they basically have more funds available from them. Um, and as a result, U.S. startups innovate more in classes where there is higher availability of these foreign uh, CVC investments. Uh, when we dig a little bit into sort of like heterogeneity of these forces and heterogeneity of the intensity of technological transfer, we see that um, kind of logically the countries that are further behind the US, sort of like they are more large countries from the frontier economy benefit more from this, from this knowledge spillovers. Uh, and uh, in particular, this spillovers, this knowledge transfer um, has a much bigger impact in more basic technology classes, more fundamental technologies that are just much harder to long term if you don't have um, a direct exposure uh, to them. So without further ado, let me uh, talk about the model. So uh, you can think about this model as building on the Schumpeterian step-by-step -step, uh, endogenous innovation framework. We're going to have two countries uh, in US and the foreign one. Uh, in each of the countries, there's going to be a variety of industries. Um, and in every industry, there's going to be one encumbered uh, per country, per industry. And of course, uh, our economy is going to be uh, open. Firms going to differ uh, in their labor productivity within a given industry. So that's why we're going to be talking about multi-step productivity gap. And obviously, innovations is something that is driving this improvements in labor productivity. Uh, firms going to compete uh, a la Bertrand. Um, and uh, productivity is going to evolve through innovations that you can produce at home. Or you can also learn from the other country by investing uh, in the country that is uh, at the frontier, if you are a larger uh, country. And what's going on um, sort of like in this, uh, in, um, in this each uh, industry within the country is that incumbents can be challenged by these startups uh, that come up with, with the ideas and a result can be more productive. Uh, more productive startups indeed can replace the incumbents, but in order to enter, they don't just need an idea, they need financing. Uh, what they can do to raise financing? First, they can, they can try to raise it domestically, uh, but if they fail to find domestic finance, uh, they are, their another option is to go uh, to a foreign investor. Uh, if they are indeed engaged uh, in this financial relationship with a foreign investor, this is what's going to trigger the cross-border investment, uh, the, the cross-border spillovers. Uh, the way it works is that the loggered incumbent from the foreign country can invest in the foreign startup to receive technology spillovers by being exposed to this uh, more sort of like superior technology. And they're also going to get some, uh, some share of profits from, uh, from this new company entering the, uh, the market. Um, 
On the other hand, the country where these startups are coming from face a security threat as a result of the spillovers. There is a chance that uh, you know, with this exposure to uh, to the technology, foreign country can gain some uh, some benefits uh, that are potentially detrimental for the uh, for the U.S. This is all. This basically all is uh, the main the main like the heart of the policy trade off that we're going to be discussing. Uh, there is on the one hand faster productivity growth because more ideas are funded as a result of more availability of the uh, of the financing but at the same time if you if you let too many foreign investors um, uh, to come then there is more threat of the knowledge spillovers and as a result national security so and uh, the main policy tool we're going to be talking about in this model is the barriers for foreign investors to come and uh, offer uh, their fundings. So uh, just a very sort of illustrative idea of how the innovation dynamics works um, in this model. Suppose we just have like three three industries and like in one industry, both US and foreign country are in neck and neck. And the second industry foreign country is uh, sort of like at the frontier and the US is falling behind. And in the third industry, uh, the foreign country is the library economy. And then uh, there are some like sort of baseline rate of uh, technology spillovers. Um, and at that rate, basically the, uh, the lager country is learning bit by bit uh, from the advanced economy and can uh, catch up. Uh, this ba baseline rate can be either incremental or, or drastic. Uh, let's focus on the, on the third industry where a foreign, foreign country uh, is behind the US. So suppose there is the new US startup that came up with a great business idea. Uh, the startup needs financing. Uh, one thing they can do is that they can find financing domestically. That just happens with, uh, with some probability P bar. Um, if, they're, if they are lucky and they get domestic financing, then the startup enters. There are no extra spillovers to the foreigners because they're kind of just like uh, getting their baseline uh, spillovers from just being there. Um, and the current incumbent in the industry three exits. Uh, now, the other opportunity, uh, if you don't have, uh, if you don't get a chance to get a domestic financing for the startup is to go abroad. So with some, uh, with, you know, the probability one minus uh, P bar, uh, there is no domestic financing. Uh, then you can go to the foreign investor. If the costs for foreign investors uh, are low enough, uh, in, other, in other words, if the barriers to, uh, to finance this startup is, are low enough, then the foreign uh, country is going to invest in the U.S. startup. Uh, what, are, what are the benefits of, uh, of this investment? Uh, well, first of all, the startup enters and the incumbent in the U.S. exits. Um, and but what's important for the foreign country, they are getting uh, spillovers at a higher rate than they would in a baseline case. Um, and again, the policy here is going to is going to alter the cost of the foreign investments. And as a result, that can change the, the decision of the foreign uh, foreign country to invest in US or or not. Um, and just to just to remind you, uh, the the main problem here is that if you don't get if you don't get a financing as a U.S. startup, then the idea is lost. Uh, right there, there is no entry, and as a result, you are sort of like losing this opportunity um, of innovation-driven growth. Uh, now we're gonna uh, kind of speed a little bit to the numeric example where where the um, I guess the nature of our model is becoming more uh, more clear. Uh, we calibrate uh, ten parameters uh, to uh, uh, with, with the US data on the uh, patents and venture capital investments. Uh, six of them are just have some counterparts, co counterparts uh, in, the, in the data, and four are going to be determined internally through the simulated methods of moments. But uh, these are only degree details that um, um, I invite you to, to check in the paper. So first thing that uh, we want to capture with this calibration exercise is the uh, investment probability of the foreign investor depending on like how far away they are from the uh from the frontier and um as you might expect the further away a country is from the frontier the more likely 
um, it is to actually engage in this corporate venture capital relationship with the U.S. startup um, in order to uh, to catch up faster. Um, Another level of heterogeneity uh, we want to capture here is how difficult it is to learn from the uh, from the frontier country from the US just through the baseline spillovers. And here we basically distinguish high basicness and low basicness technologies. Uh, by high basicness, we mean like more fundamental knowledge that is more difficult to uh, just sort of like learn from um, on the background. So you might need more exposure to it through the CVC investment to actually catch up in this uh, more complicated classes. So as a result, the more basic the sector is, the lower are the baseline spillovers, and thus the more incentives a foreign country is to get this like extra knowledge flows. So we're gonna have a higher probability of uh, corporate venture capital investments uh, in uh, higher basic uh, classes. And another two um, another two takeouts uh, we are uh, we got from this uh, numerical exercise is that we did verify that indeed cross border investments boost technology spillovers to the foreign countries, and cross border investments uh, do support domestic innovation and and more ideas are getting funded um, as a result. When we're gonna uh, when we're gonna like think about the optimal policy here, uh, we're gonna basically model it as a tax on the costs of foreign corporate venture capital investments. So the idea here is that um, every time a foreign country has an opportunity to invest in US, it draws costs from some distribution. And what US policy can do is to proportionally change the upper bound of this distribution where, where foreign investors are drawing their costs from. Um, on the uh, on the other hand, though, we're going to have uh, some security costs that U.S. has to pay, um, and these costs are proportional to the massive investment, the massive investing foreign uh, foreign firms. Um, all right. So, what do we? What kind of insights we gain in terms of the optimal foreign policy uh, from our model? So, first of all. Uh, Obviously, we do see that uh, there are benefits for the consumers from the reduction in the barriers to foreign investments, and these benefits are just resulting from the higher growth. Uh, so in terms of the scale, the uh, negative numbers on the horizontal axis here is the decrease, the relative decrease in the barriers uh, to foreign investment, and the positive numbers is increasing barriers of foreign investment. So we do see that from the consumer benefit perspective, the optimal policy would be to reduce uh, barriers uh, by 52%. Um, and obviously this is all goes through the higher penetration by foreign investors, less barriers, more foreign investors, more funding opportunity, uh, more ideas are getting fund, uh, higher, higher innovation driven growth. Um, and this is exactly what, what is captured in, uh, in panel C there. Uh, on the on the other hand, again, the the main trade off here is that if we if we decrease the barriers uh, of uh, of entry too high, we see a very steep increase in the security costs. So the, the optimal policy is going to try to uh, balance out these benefits from the growth and this increase in the in the security costs. Um, and I think this is probably a good uh, time to see if we have any. Uh, any questions we want to bring up uh, right now? Josh? I think that's great. We've, we've, we've tried to answer most of the questions as they uh, come along. I guess uh, one question that a number of people have is um, how do you think about corporate venture capitalists versus independent venture capitalists or even acquisit or even acquisitions um, and what motivates the um, the um, uh, the focus on corporate venturing why uh, do you want me to take this question <laughs> uh, uh, why don't you take a stab at it and obviously uh, Sina or myself can do so as well or Rick can do so as well right so first of all um, I think we have a pretty 
pretty good data on the mm-hmm. on the relationship on on the on the investments coming from the foreign uh from the foreign corporate venture capitals. They're very well documented, so it's quite a quite nice to work with that. And second, uh, the nature of the relationship between the venture capital investment and the startup is quite different from the nature of relationship between the like the firm that acquires a startup. Like if you invest in something, you are like motivated to to like let this startup grow without necessarily um, just uh, like either kind of cannibalizing its its and incorporating it as your own um, in in your own company. Uh, and you know you're also kind of want to get the, the the financial benefits from it uh, without spending too much money to buy it. So as a result, like this venture capital uh, investors, they can get exposure to different ideas and different innovations without necessarily buying the whole package, so to say. Uh, and that's why I got a special interest in the sort of like the benefits that the that the startups are getting from the corporate venture capitals. Like Song has a great uh, great paper on that. So it it got a little bit of more, I guess, like tension in the literature because we do notice more technology spillovers that are a easier to capture in the data than to capture technology spillovers once the company is acquired because uh, it's all sort of like reported in one in one chunk um, and b there is more sort of like diversity um, of relationship that we can that we can see in the data um, this is sort of my my 50 cents on that yeah I think that's great one right. other quick thought, um, and Josh probably will know more about this than me, but I mean, my sense is that there's been, a, the, you know, there's a lot more scrutiny in the past uh, thinking about foreign acquisitions of companies. Mm-hmm. And this is something that kind of more recently people have been thinking about as kind of an under the radar way mm-hmm. that foreign countries may be um, learning about US technologies. So um, it's, it's more of a new uh, phenomenon. So that's another reason why we're kind of studying it. Right. That in a way, it sort of served as a bit of a potential backdoor around uh, some of the uh, acquisitions, which have been more scrutinized. All right. Hopefully, we're not going to hear too much criticism from Song that corporate venturing isn't doesn't lead to knowledge flows. All right. Should we press ahead? Sure. Let's. Uh... Uh, let's move to the empirics. So we're going to now switch gears a little bit and talk about the more data intense part of, uh, of our paper. And this, the main, again, to remind you, the main goal here is going to be A, to verify the assumptions and the implication of our model and to sort of like put more numbers and estimations into uh, this knowledge spillovers uh, that we're trying to capture. So our two main data sources is you know, the data on venture capital investments and the data on patents. The data on venture capital investments comes from uh, Refinit Venture Expert, uh, which is used to be uh, Thomas Van Reuters uh, Refinit Venture Expert database. Uh, we, the, the data is very rich and it has like lots of different variables, but the, those that we're using in particular in our research are, first of all, the actual dates of the venture capital financing rounds and uh, whether it's the first, the second, or the follow-up financing round. Uh, we do observe venture capital firms, uh, their names, their locations, and the startups that are uh, funded by them. Uh, importantly, we can observe the amounts invested uh, by each party in every financial round. Uh, the, uh, the problem with this, with, this data, with this data is that even though it does uh, it does provide information on the type of the venture capital uh, agent that we're dealing with. It's not always accurate and the locations are also not uh, very reliable. So we have to manually identify uh, corporate venture capitalists, uh, just like from the, uh, from the public and private sources that, you know, the list of the corporate venture capitalists that we are, uh, were able to, to find. Uh, there were about 540 overall uh, corporate venture capitalists in the data. Uh, among those, about 60%, uh, 344 are foreign-based. 
And these foreign-based uh, corporate venture capitalists are from 32 distinct countries. So we also have quite a quite a good representation of different of different nations here. Uh, the data on the innovations is coming from the US Patent Office. Uh, we are focusing on the granted utility patents. Uh, and even though we are focusing on the granted patents, the primary date that we're using is the date of the application as we sort of like assume that this is the date wherein this technology is becoming like public uh, and available for uh, for the knowledge spillovers to, to everyone. Uh, we do observe original patent assignee name and their location. This is how we're gonna match uh, our assignees and the patent data to the firms um, in the venture capital investment database. Um, and uh, another important variable here is going to be sort of like some characteristic of the patent that's going to be a technology class. And we're gonna be using sort of like interchangeably two uh, classifications, the original United States Patent Office classification and the cooperative patent uh, classification, sort of the new, uh, the new one. When we match assignees to both US startups and to uh, US, uh, and, and to foreign corporate venture capital investors, we get a quite a good uh, intersection between the between the two databases. Um, in particular, we see that about 30% of startups that we uh, match to the patent data have uh, at least one patent. So there is quite a big share of the of the US companies that are actually innovative. Uh, and before we sort of like jump into the more structural analysis, let me uh, let me tell you a couple of sort of like stylized fact as to um, as to trigger our our discussion and put some like framework into that. Uh, so as I mentioned into introduction, there is quite a significant increase in the share of uh, corporate venture capital investments among all venture capital investment, and this increase is actually both driven by the higher presence of corporations in the venture capital market and the presence of the foreign corporations in the venture capital market. So this is, this is driven by both uh, of these um, increases. And um, another, another fact that we wanna like put straight out there is that uh, it does seem that US startups indeed uh, could benefit potentially from this like rising availability of the venture capital investments like here, uh, we basically plot uh, in green the uh, number of startups uh, that are either uh, gathering the first round of the startups on the left hand side or gathering any round uh, of the uh, of the investments on the right hand side. Um, and the green line is uh, the uh, the foreign corporate venture capital um, investments uh, available in this year. And we do see quite a quite a positive correlation between uh, between these two uh, between these two indicators. So it does seem that, uh, you know, foreign corporate venture capital capitalists do not just sort of like uh, uh, take the room from the from the domestic corporates, but they indeed are conducive to uh, to innovations um, in, in in US startups. Um, so first of all, we want to try to sort of like capture empirically this idea in our model that the probability of getting an investment of getting a fund uh, depends on, on how far away foreign country is uh, to the US. So how how many steps behind this foreign country is uh, is comparative to the US. And in order to sort of like measure this technological gap between the two countries, we are uh, we constructed this indicator of relative knowledge. Uh, this is sort of like foreign country dependent, patent class dependent, and year dependent. So uh, this is a share of all patents uh, submitted by foreign country in a particular technology class in some year T uh, relative to sort of like all the patents submitted by this country and the US uh, in this technology class in a given year. So the relative knowledge is sort of like the reverse of the gap, the highest the relative knowledge of a foreign country in a certain technology class, the smaller is 
the gap uh, between the two countries. Um, and when we are when we measure sort of like this this probability of the investments as just an indicator, we see we see quite a strong negative correlation between the relative knowledge uh, and the probability of investment. Again, that just means that the uh, the bigger is the relative knowledge of the foreign country, or in other words, the smaller is the gap, the less likely this foreign country is going to engage into the corporate venture capital relationship with US startups. Even if we like measure sort of the, um, uh, the investments as, as in numbers instead of just the uh, uh, extensive margin, we still see the strong negative uh, correlation between the two. Again, we we're not imposing any causality here. Uh, there, they might be some, you know, some emitted variables or uh, or 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 something else like screwing up with the with the direct channel. But you know, the this correlation is pretty strong, and it um, it speaks uh, directly to the results of our our model. Um, and you know, the the problem here again with establishing the causality is that the cross border startup investments can be can be endogenous. So in the next part, we're going to try to actually understand whether foreign country subsequently increase patenting in the technology class that they invest into. In other in other ways, do we actually see sort of like causal technology spillovers coming from the startup to the foreign investor? Uh, and the the main problem, the, the main sort of like endogeneity problem that we are facing here is that there could be some shock to to the technology that both affects patenting in this technology in the foreign country and the decision to invest in this technology um, uh, as well. But what we want to establish, what sort of like the channel we want to establish here, is the direct impact from the cross border investment in a technology to the patenting in this technology in a foreign country. So our approach to channel is going to be difference and differences. Uh, the level of analysis here is going to be country and class. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna approach this exercise by constructing a control group for every treatment group. The treatment group is going to be the class where the, con the foreign country have invested. And the control group is going to be the most similar class where this country have not invested. So the uh, here the idea is that you know we're saying that the foreign corporate venture capitalists invest in U.S. startups, and this results sort of like in the changers of their of their patenting, like they start patent more in the classes that they invest in and less in the other classes. So what we're going to do, we're going to compare the certain foreign country innovation growth in the funded classes to uh, their innovation activity in the similar unfunded classes. And what do we mean by, by similarity? Just the, the, the country's pre-investment patents and citations activity um, in these class. Um, alternative defensive strategy is going to be to construct this control group not on a class level but on a country level. So instead of comparing uh, countries' innovation growth in the classes that they haven't funded, we're going to find a country uh, that is most similar to the treatment country, and we're going to compare the uh, innovation growth in the country that invested in this uh, technology to the innovation growth in the country that has not invested uh, in the same technology. Um, but the, the results are going to be very, very similar between these two approaches. And uh, for, uh, for the further discussion, we're going to focus on this class-based control group. Um, so what we see here is the sort of like results of the event study where we uh, try to capture this technology spillovers through the annual patenting activity in a given technology class by a foreign country in comparison to the control group and their citation activity, sort of like citations that they are giving to, to the patents in this technology class, um, again, on the annual basis. And these citations are supposedly uh, good at capturing uh, the learning that 
uh, that foreign countries are getting from the exposure to, to this technology. Uh, we do see that both like um, when we use the patents and citations as proxies, uh, the before the investment event, there is there is uh, quite a, quite a flat pre-trend uh, in the in the innovation activity in the foreign country. But once uh, once the foreign country invested in the uh, in the certain technology for the first time, we see a relative increase in its um, in its innovation activity further down the road. Uh, both in patents and in the citations in this technology relative to the technologies that this country um, has never invested in. So again, that, uh, that, is, our, that is our evidence for, uh, for the positive uh, uh, effect uh, coming from the corporate venture capital investments. Um, now we wanna uh, dig a little bit deeper into, um, into the spillovers uh, and consider the heterogeneity based on basicness of the technology classes. And again, here, the idea is that the more basic the technology, uh, the technology is, the more difficult it is to learn uh, sort of like on a baseline level. And as a result, they're gonna be more incentives to get higher exposure to this fundamental, more complicated technologies through the corporate venture capital investments. The way we measure basicness in the data uh, is uh, based on the citations to academic research by patents in a certain class. So our measure of basicness is going to be class and year specific. And then we just basically uh, dividing, dividing classes in the two groups for every year, classes that are uh, sort of like in the bottom bottom half um, of the basicness we call low basicness classes and the patent classes that are on the uh, top um, of the basicness measure uh, are going to be high basicness measure uh, high basicness patents and what we what we see that indeed there are much stronger spillovers in more basic classes that are captured here in blue uh, they sort of like experience um, they're more sensitive to this uh, to this exposure uh, to technologies after after investment, uh, and again, this is just due to lower baseline spillovers coming in this uh, in this high basicness classes. Um, and finally, we want to you know most of our analysis is happening on the country class year level. We want to now go uh, a little bit sort of like in the micro level and move from the country class level to corporation startup level in order to understand uh, what are what are exactly the implications for for a certain company uh, after investing in a certain startup um, sort of like on the startup level uh, on the on the company level uh, rather than on the country level and again our proxy here for capturing whether the, con the, the corporation is learning from the US startup is going to be citations. Uh, in particular, our variable of interest is going to be uh, a probability uh, of citing a patent belonging to a startup where a certain company um, has put their money on. Um, the idea is if you, are, if you learn from a startup, uh, you are learning from their patents, and as a result, you are citing the patents of this um, of this startup more after the investment event. Um, you got and four minutes. Oh, sorry, Eli, just four minutes. Yeah, yeah, no, great. Uh, that's perfect. Um, and indeed, indeed, we see that uh, post uh, post corporate venture capital investment, uh, foreign uh, foreign companies are more likely to cite. Uh, startup patents that they have invested in. Uh, that is true uh, even when we focus on the years where startups actually produce patents, because there are going to be like lots of zeros that's going to sort of like drive this uh, this coefficient up. Uh, but even even focusing on this like innovating startup that are consistently innovating, uh, we see a double increase in the probability uh, of citing a U.S. startup uh, after the investment event. Uh, so again, this is this doesn't doesn't have uh, necessarily causal implications, but uh, but the uh, the correlation, the association is pretty strong in this exercise. Um, and finally, to sort of like wrap up this discussion and uh, get back to one of the uh, stylized fact. Uh, pictures that I showed you in the beginning, uh, 
here we are trying to more explicitly show that uh, U.S. startups actually benefit from higher availability of foreign corporate venture capital investments. Uh, what we do is we are uh, we try to capture sort of like this benefits of the uh, for the for the U.S. startups using four different variables. Like um, as a startup activity, we use. Uh, First of all, the number of patenting U.S. startups, both new startups and all active startups on the market. Um, and we also look at the number of U.S. startups patents that they that they produce annually. And again, we distinguish between the patents coming from the brand new startups and the all active startups. Um, and we do see that there is a quite strong positive uh, correlation between the uh, the uh, size of the foreign investment available uh, in a certain technology class in a certain year and the startups activity in this technology class uh, in this year. So that does that does sort of like imply that uh, US startups actually benefit from uh, from the presence of corporate venture capital investors and as a result there should be indeed uh, benefits for uh, for the innovation driven growth as uh, as implied uh, by our model. So to uh, to wrap up uh, this this initial discussion of our paper, uh, we presented a model uh, that uh, has a stylized setting where startups can attract investments from foreign corporations. Uh, the main trade off in this model is coming from the fact that uh, the availability of the foreign uh, foreign foreign funding allows young firm to pursue innovations that otherwise could have been just unfunded and lost. As a result, them, some gross opportunities would be lost. But at the same time, these investments may lead to knowledge spillovers to the foreign corporations and its nation. Um, and startups do not internalize this, this security, security threat, but Social Planet does. Uh, we then present empirical results consistent with the presence of knowledge spillovers to foreign investors. Uh, we um, we analyze uh, some some numerical examples, trying to uh, trying to understand what would be the optimal uh, foreign policy in this context, and we think that uh, our paper raises a number of avenues for for future research. Uh, we uh, we can think about uh, also the implications for the uh, relationship between the. Uh, foreign uh, corporate venture capitalists and startups uh, in a more in a sense that is more targeted to the startups and what kind of like new opportunities they are gaining from the uh, from this relationship uh, maybe uh, more sort of like market reach uh, um, and so on and so forth we can also think about how these all ties together with the business cycle but more generally uh, the policies uh, to modulate foreign corporate investments uh, should be seen in the context of a broader area of policies affecting competitive positions of startups. And uh, we hope that this paper is going to boost more research in, um, in, uh, in this field. Um, and yeah, I think that's, uh, that's going to be the first part of, of the talk. Perfect. Thank you, Ilya, for a great and clear uh, presentation. And uh, Thank you everyone for the active engagement based on the volume of the chest that's already in presence. I believe everybody's very interested. Uh, so, but before going into the Q&A, we are very lucky to have Juanita Gonzalez Uribe from LSE, uh, who is definitely an expert on knowledge spillover and VC to talk about uh, her thoughts about the paper. And uh, Juanita, you have 15 minutes. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I have some issues with my internet, so I'm crossing my fingers that it's not gonna happen again. Hopefully it will not. Um, let me just make this big. Okay. Good, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me to discuss this paper. It was a super interesting read, also very thought provoking. Um, so I was very happy to do so. Okay, so um, let me start with, um, Kind of like an overview of my comments then i'll give you a summary of what the paper of what i took from the paper when i read it and then i'll move to my comments so here's my overall impression so i think the paper is about a very interesting and very relevant topic 
Um, I also think it's got very provocative policy implications. And I think that in the course of my reading, a lot of questions basically surfaced, some very interesting questions to ponder. Now, I do think there are areas for potential improvement, and a couple of them are the following. So first, I think it would be great to have a little bit more motivation behind the modeling choices. And I'm going to try to explain why I think that's important, in particular in relation with the interpretation about the policy implications. Second way in which there could be an improvement is by tightening the empirical evidence. When I basically logged off um, and then I came back, I saw that maybe some of these things have already been done, which is great because that means we're kind of aligned. So I may repeat some things, but anyway, you let me know because I kind of missed a little bit of the, of the presentation. And then finally, um, I also think there's a little bit of an area for improvement in terms of the policy discussions. Um, and, and, and I mean that in relation with other potential things the government could have done. And so I want to think about that a little bit more deeply. Okay, so here's, that's my overall impression. Let me now go to um, what I took away from the paper and then I'll go to my comments. So what I think this paper is about, and this is after Julia's great presentation. So I think that um, this paper is, is first establishes a very important fact, which is that venture capital investments by foreign corporations have become increasingly important in the US. And then they basically say, which I completely agree, there's very little understanding of the consequences of such inbound investments for a number of things that we care about. So the first thing is just for the local ventures, second for the overseas firms, and this is both for the corporate sponsors that are making the investments, as well as other firms in the countries that may, uh, as we will see in the model, et cetera, benefit from potential knowledge spillovers. And then finally, perhaps more generally, um, to the consequences of what I'm going to call the innovation edge of the U.S., right? So the ability of the U.S. or, you know, the, the country that they have in mind to be really kind of like an innovation frontier. Now, what I, as I see this paper, I think it's the first paper to really first, well, document that first fact, you know, that this foreign investments by co foreign corporations are important and have been increasingly so. Um, and also link that to patenting and cross-border citations. So, exchanges of innovation resources in some, in some sense, and do so both empirically and theoretically. In terms of the theory, I think the main theory trade-off is thinking about how investments by these foreign corporations can have a bright side because they can help relax any potential local financial constraints that you know, could be in existence in the US, um, but that could come at a cost. And that is cross-border technology spillovers that at the end, you know taken to its logical conclusion could potentially lead the US to kind of like lose its innovation edge. Now, in terms of the empirics, um, I think with the paper, you know, main findings is that after um, foreign investments in US ventures, you see this increase in, in, in patenting and in citations in areas that are related to what the startup, um, you know, is, is kind of like innovating in. And finally, in terms of policy, it's it basically the conclusion, and this is what I thought was very thought provoking, is that it may be very optimal for the US government to raise the costs to deter inbound investments precisely because of this potential cross-border technology spillovers that could you know, potentially lead the US to lose its innovation edge. So that to me is kind of like the paper. So let me go to the comments. So my first comment is about motivating modeling choices. And, and, and the, the authors have this great paragraph in which they say, look, we have a lot of work on, you know, on, on entrepreneurial finance that focuses on this particular figure on the P, right? Motivating why P is less than one. And we wanna focus on something else. And I'm not questioning that P is less than one. I believe in that. Um, what I wanna know a, a little bit more is what is the story as to why some local ventures cannot secure financing? And the reason why I think that's important is because I think it impacts the policy implications. And so, so let me try and, 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 and put more structure to that. So the typical rationale why, you know, why we think in the typical entrepreneurial finance model that some companies may go underfunded is that there's some information asymmetries that exist between firms and potential investors that lead to this underinvestment, right? And this is because this information asymmetries make it difficult for investors to assess firms and possibly permit opportunistic behavior after financing. Now we have this long literature that says that venture capital firms mitigate these frictions using a variety of tools, right? Intense due diligence, monitoring and contracting tools, mo most of which possibly work better the closer the VCs are to the, are to the firms. So 
Under this explanation, so if P is less than one because of some information asymmetries, I think what that would imply, like taking that argument to its logical conclusion, is that the ideas that are funded locally would probably be the ones that are of worse quality. And in some sense, the foreign VCs are less likely to have you know, better information than local investors. And what that would mean is that these foreign CVCs you know, are not really a threat to the edge of a, you know, the US innovation. I don't really think that would justify some sort of like closing the borders, right? Like increasing this cost for foreign investments. But I do believe there are motivations for which P can be less than one that can lead to that. And so this is what I think the authors have in mind, but I didn't see it explicitly in the paper. And so what could be going on here is that this heterogeneity in the assets, in the complementary assets that investors may have that differ across countries. So what I have in mind is the following. So an alternative explanation is that some local ventures go underfunded because local investors happen to lack the complementary assets that can really, you know, help them appropriate returns from that innovation. And so what I have here in mind is, you know, the successful commercialization of a particular innovation typically requires combining the know-how of the inventor with other resources that the inventor typically lacks and that are actually quite hard to get because the process of getting them is typically fraught with information and potentially contracting friction. Now, in my papers uh, on venture capital, I've tried to argue that venture capital investors, just as we think of them as mitigating this information asymmetries that I mentioned before, I think that they also, you know, have tools to mitigate these frictions of really getting the complementary resources to increase the appropriation of innovation. And this is because, among some of the things, they invest in firms that have complementary assets. And they also facilitate actively exchanges of this innovation resources within their portfolio. And so I have some evidence of that. There's also a paper by Lindsay that has also like suggestive evidence of this. Now, under this explanation, what would happen is that the foreign corporate venture capitalists may have the complementary assets that local investors lack, making them willing to invest when local investors will not, or actually pay higher prices, right? So in, in while the model is not sequential, and like, you know, who's investing first and whether these are ideas that are left behind or not, there is this narrative of it's the firms that are not able to secure financing, the ones that actually then later have to seek uh, foreign financing. So it's kind of confusing in the model. But anyway, this would be like a potential explanation as to why would, that would happen. And moreover, it would also imply that the, that the ideas that are not funded locally are not necessarily the worst, right? And in that same foreign VCs can actually pose this threat that I think the paper is trying to argue, right? So in what I think is my, my first suggestion would be, I know that you don't wanna emphasize or you know, focus on you know, having a model of why P is less than one, but certainly providing a potential explanation of why this happens potentially in, in the terms that I've been suggesting, right? Thinking about complementary assets and how this could differ across geographies could provide like a better motivation for the policy analysis that I thought was a little bit missing when I read the paper. Okay, so that was my first comment, which was about motivating modeling choices. My second comment is about tightening the empirics. And this is the part where I said that I think I saw some of my suggestions already being implemented when I came back after I was cut off. So if I'm repeating things that the public and the authors already saw, I'm sorry about that. But here's what I thought about the, the empirics. I think the empirics in the paper that I read were mostly about you collapse the data at the technology class, country, time level. And then you're basically comparing whether after the investment by a foreign corporation on a particular startup, we see more patenting activity and citation activity in the technology classes associated with that startup, right? By foreign firms. So that's, you know, and this is kind of like the chart or the, the figure that they had, which I think it's, it's quite telling. But I thought when I read that they could actually tighten the connection to what I think the model had in mind. And in particular with what I just said about the appropriation of returns inside uh, corporate venture capital portfolios. And so my tighter link was to suggest for the observations to be either at the panel level or even at the company level or startup level. And this is what I think I saw a little bit of that already, right? So you could imagine that instead of just looking at the pattern classes that the startup is particularly active in, you could actually ask the question of whether the corporate venture capital firm is citing the patents of the startup and whether other you know, firms in the country are also citing, right? And actually 
distinguishing between those two types of citations, right? Because I think that if you're able to show that indeed the sponsor is citing more the patterns of the startup that it invests in, then I think this links nicely with the story of appropriation of returns that I have in mind. And that would be not only the sponsor, but actually other companies that the corporate sponsor has also invested in within its country, right? Because it's in there where you would actually expect this facilitation of innovation resources that I had in mind in my paper with independent venture capitalists to also be at play when you're thinking about corporate venture capital investment. Now, I was also thinking about once you look at the foreign firms that are making the citations, I thought it would also be interesting to distinguish between, you know, the, the types of firms. Are these incumbent firms that are making the citations? I mean, above and beyond the sponsor, let's say, are there incumbent firms, or, or are the new is the new connection with the U.S. instead inspiring some incumbent firms as well, right? And I think that those two types of, of spillovers are very different, and it would be interesting to distinguish between the two. Now, finally, my my last comment in terms of empirics is that. You're focusing on citations, you're focusing on patents as well, but you could imagine that, you know, there's other forms of, of, of spillovers and other that could be either more direct or indirect that you can actually measure. And I, I think you, it would basically strengthen your, your story and could actually um, show other mechanisms through which these spillovers could be taking place. And so I'm sure I'm going to show here some plots of my paper uh, when I was focusing on venture capital in the US. But you can imagine not using only citations, but you can think about patent sales as well, right? Uh, patent reassignments. You can think about um, flows of inventors as well. So are we talking about a brain drain or is this like a, a, a completely different phenomenon? Of course, you can think about lately about at the end about alliances, mergers and acquisitions. Basically, the point is there's other ways in which this uh, spillovers can manifest. And I think that documenting that would be super interesting and could also help you distinguish between different mechanisms and different stories behind the broad patterns that you showed in the draft that I read. And then finally, in terms of policy. So I thought the policy implications were super provocative. Um, I, I was like completely um, focused on this phrase that I read that said, despite the benefits from inbound investments for US firms, it may be optimal for the US government to raise their costs to deter investments. And I was, I have to say that I reacted very negatively when I first read it. I was like, what's going on here? Um, and I think that one of the main uh, kind of like basic things that I thought the model was missing is that, you know, it, it, it was a bit static in the sense that it wasn't considering, you know, if, if the US were to raise the cost, you know, potential retaliation by other countries, right? You could imagine that this is likely, we see that all the time with visas, right? So. I remember growing up that in Colombia, I mean, we've always been asked to have a visa when we go to the US. And I remember that growing up, the US imposed new visas to Brazil and the Brazilians, as a response to this, basically retaliated by asking for US uh, travelers to have a visa as well. And I remember uh, uh, growing up in Colombia, we were, you know, we felt very happy when Brazilians were doing this. Uh, we just thought it was kind of like a bit of a war. Um, but anyway, coming back to this, you could imagine that there could be retaliation, right? So other countries seeing the US raise the cost of investments, they may react just like that. And, and while the model is, not, the, the paper is not considering the, the fact that the US also could be potentially benefiting from investments in startups in other countries, in practice, it's actually quite substantial, right? So this comes from a paper by Bradley, the Ruffler, Hellman and Wilson, they're looking at cross-border venture capital investments, and they're also discussing what the role of public policy is. They're thinking here about the investment that the U.S. is doing in countries, in, sorry, in startups abroad. And basically the point of the paper, and they show this in a, in a number of ways at the beginning, is also documenting how important these investments are, right? So here in the plot, you can see that with respect to European funding, um, the, the U.S. is participating quite aggressively in this, right? Like almost 20% of European investments are coming from the U.S. And, and the paper shows this in a number of ways, right? They split this in terms of, of the location of different types of investors. And U.S. Uh, investors are one of the most active in, in different countries, right? So you can see there investors from the U.S. and Canada. Of course, some of these are explained by Canadian investors. Um, in, in different countries in Europe, for example, in the UK, it's basically, you know, 30% of the funds, substantial. 
Uh, again, this is another way of showing the same data, a different breakdown for different countries in, in, the, in, in Europe, basically all going to the same point, which is that I, I, I would have thought that in a model in which we're thinking about the dynamics between different countries, the imposition of a particular policy can bring about retaliation by other countries. And if you take this to its logical conclusion, that would be detrimental for innovation overall. And so I, I think that would be an interesting thing to add in some, in some form to the policy analysis. And finally, that was kind of like, as I said, it was kind of like the, my, my main reaction to that was negative because I was thinking about this potential retaliation. But going back to my first comment, so beyond retaliation, keep you know, to take that away. Going back to my first comment with respect to motivating the, 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 the modeling choices that they make. I think this is where understanding why P is less than one is important. Because I think my, my main issue when I was reading this is that I kept thinking that instead of increasing the cost, perhaps what the government should do instead is addressing what it's the market failure in some sense, which is that P is less than one, right? And, and that's exactly what the paper by Thomas and, and, and co-authors does a little bit. They start to think about what are the different ways in which cross-border in, in, um, investments you know, can affect both positively and negatively the two countries involved in that transaction and then discuss the different types of policies that, that you can consider above and beyond raising or decreasing the costs of these investments. And so what I would invite the authors to do uh, perhaps is think more about what's the motivating market failure that explains why these cross-border investments are happening. And then thinking about whether the government what should be doing is thinking about the P rather than closing somehow the borders. But anyway, um, conclusion, I thought it was a super interesting super relevant, novel topic, um, super provocative policy implications, raises lots of questions to ponder. I think there are some areas for potential improvement, uh, but I'm pretty sure these guys will nail it. So that's it. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Juanita. Um, do you guys want to take some time to respond? We're a little, you know, almost near the end, so, um, but feel free. I mean, I just, I just would say great comments. Thank you so much, Juanita. For them, I mean, there's a lot of food for thought there. I especially like the idea of looking at some of the other measures of spillovers and what we might be able to do there. Um, so, lots of lots of great thought. Thanks. Uh, great. So, anyone in the audience, uh, you know, didn't have a chance to ask in the chat that has a question for the presenter or the the group co-author group, feel free to unmute yourself. I think you guys addressed the chat questions from what I saw. If, uh, Can I just make a one quick uh, comment to uh, one of uh, Juanita's points? Please. All right. So Juanita, thanks, thanks so much for, for the great comments. I just want to uh, highlight one of the issues that you brought up. Um, uh, first of all, uh, the, the point about P being less than one and then the re retaliation about the modeling choices, I think those are two excellent points. Of course, you know, when there is this type of cross-border uh, investments, it, it affects both the quantity and the quality of the patents uh, or the qual quality and quantity of the, of the, of the uh, innovations that are being produced. Obviously, this also uh, relates to one of Abraham's uh, earlier points so obviously we are living in a general equilibrium framework and the resources are limited. And uh, so uh, the availability of the local funding affects the quantity. But on top of this, as you mentioned, there are also potentially some asymmetric uh, information issues with which projects to fund, et cetera. There's also the quality aspect. So that's why I think given the lack of work in this direction, this is the first step in, in trying to uh, understand the quantity of the of the innovations, but the uh, uh, quality can definitely be addressed. For instance, you know, we can easily empirically test whether you know, foreign funded versus local uh, funded patents, if they uh, show any uh, citation difference or quality difference. And accordingly, we can easily uh, bring this uh, into the model. So thanks for that suggestion. And the second point about retaliation, Sina, Atish, and, and I have a, a, have a separate paper where we were focusing on the trade policy of the US and whether you know, closing the borders would be detrimental for innovation or not. Indeed, our results were very much highlighting 
the detrimental effect of retaliation uh, that can that can emerge from a foreign country again in order to come up with the ultimate welfare answer we need to first know what happens without the re retaliation and then with retaliation so that's why i think again this can be seen as the first step in understanding that and then we can also uh, incorporate the retaliation part that would add an additional layer on 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 already complicated models. So we have to discuss within the co-author group whether you know it would be worth going that in this paper or not. But that's a that's a great point too. Thanks, thanks for both uh, both comments. What, uh, if I can just add one thing um, on the P less than one issue, I think we we definitely need to sort of think more carefully about that. Um, but I, I, it's not clear to me that um, we should necessarily think of foreign investors as investing in kind of the marginal stuff that couldn't get funded by domestic investors. That's going to be bad stuff that they wouldn't be able to learn from anyway. You could think of them as just sort of being dumb money. That's more of a spray and pray sort of strategy that just says, here's a technology area we want to invest in. We're going to be very aggressive and bid on lot, you know, outbid US investors on uh, startups in that area, um, you know, just offering better valuations. You know, if we think about SoftBank or something, it's not like they're investing in the last startup that couldn't got funded by US investors. And then that just adds money to the system, which would, you know, allow more startups in total to get funded. But I don't necessarily think it has to be that the foreign investors are investing in the marginal stuff that just couldn't get funded. Maybe giving a very last two cents uh, from myself as well on that uh, P issue, given everyone chipped in. So uh, piggybacking on uh, Rick's point. Uh, so at the end, we observe in, like a boost to the uh, patenting activity and like uh, citation activity that goes uh, to the um, to the funding uh, county or the laggard county. So it might be the case, of course, like there, and for sure there is some heterogeneity across ideas, but apparently it is the case, even if these are maybe some organ ideas by uh, VC, like local VCs, they produce some value in terms of spillovers and learning to abroad. You're, you're correct. Maybe if these were like high quality ideas, maybe they could have created more, but it seems there is, they, have, they still have potential uh, to create some spillovers and then maybe security threat back to the US, uh, even, even at this level. So I completely agree that at the margin, the heterogeneity could have affected uh, what like uh, maybe some quantitative implications but just jumping to the conclusion that they, these ideas wouldn't create any security threat uh, might not be as straightforward as my idea but thank you very much uh, for all the thought-provoking ideas thank you but what i was suggesting was like a different kinds of different types of frictions that could give you exactly the result that i think you're after mm -hmm. which is that you know, it, it doesn't have to be the standard information asymmetries that we think of, right? So yeah. I think it's going to be a hard battle to win to say that, you know, the co corporate venture capital investors that are abroad somehow like have better information than the local investors. I, But instead, you could think of them as deferring in terms of the assets that they have, in terms of how complementary they are to the startups that are within, you know, the, the local economy. And that would be like, a, it's, a, it's, it's an equilibrium, right? I mean, the local investors don't want to invest because they cannot appropriate the returns from those investments as well as the foreigners can because they have assets that are more complementary to that. So I think you know, that, that naturally leads to, to your story. So what I'm providing is like a, a, a different motivation for why P is less than one. In terms of the spray and pray, I agree, it could be that, but if it's spray and pray, then the policy implications are I mean, if these guys are not really strategically picking the best companies that will generate the the most technology spillovers, then are we should we really worry about the security threat? That's what I was thinking. Whereas in the in the in, in the idea of them having like different complementary assets, they kind of accidentally invest in you know they invest in some good and some bad, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, in the other story, the magnitude would be uh, uh, much stronger. I agree with that. Like if these are complementary assets. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah, that, that was just an idea. But uh, yeah, the point is, I think that motivating the P less than one better would lead to a better discussion of the policy. That's it. Yeah. Maybe. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody for your questions to the 
uh, presenting team for the paper and Juanita for the discussion. Uh, I guess we'll end on that. Uh, I'm putting in the chat next week's talk. Jay Ritter is presenting a paper called SPACs, uh, Special Purpose Acquisition Corporations, I think is what it stands for. So uh, many of you probably heard of it. So check it out. Register if you have the time next Monday. Thanks again for coming. We'll see everyone soon. Thanks, everyone.